This screencast is on our final competitive firm, and this one is the oligopoly. Um, oligopolies are the most dominant type of competitive structure, and so we find a lot of examples out in the real world that we can use. Um, when we're talking about an oligopoly, the way you figure out, the main way that you figure out if it's an oligopoly or not is if you have a few firms in the industry that dominate it. And what happens is that they take up a large portion of the market share. And so, for example, when you talk about soft, um, soft drinks, there's a lot of different soft drinks out there, but the ones that dominate the industry would be like Coke and Pepsi. Um, this would be about fast food. You have McDonald's, Burger King, come on, we love their Whoppers, but McDonald's and Burger King and um, Wendy's, they dominate the industry. You only have like two, three, maybe four, but it's really about two or three that usually dominate the industry. Um, when we talk about gas, you have Shell and BP. Um, always used to be used was the car industry. You know, you had the big three of Ford, GM, and Chrysler. I'm not as compelled to use them as an example anymore, but I noticed that your book did. So um, that's one that if you see it, I think it still falls in there. However, I feel like because of the foreign market, if we're, if we're talking about the U.S. market, for sure those three dominate. But if we're talking about the car industry all in general, that one tends to make me a little leery sometimes now to use as an example. But some of the things that I want to look at, first off, there's a lot of buzzwords that go along with this oligopoly, where you have a few firms that dominate the industry. The first one that you have here are, are the terms interdependence, meaning that these firms are very dependent upon one another. If their prices go one way for Shell, like that's where I always think about you, used to see, instead of now it's all computerized, but you used to see out on the street when you drive by, you have Shell and BP, and they're like right across the street from each other. You'd see the guy with the little stick in his hand, and he'd be changing the price of gas, and it would go down like by a penny, and then the guy across the street at the other gas station would be doing the same thing. And that's that price leadership, where when one lowers the price, the other one's going to follow, because the law of demand says as price goes down, quantity demanded goes up. So they have like these sticky prices that they kind of follow, and they look at one another and kind of go in that same direction. The other thing is that what these firms do, though, in oligopolies is that they have some type of product differentiation as a way for them to compete outside of these sticky prices. And so advertising is really expensive for oligopolies, and that's their major form of non-price competition. This makes the freedom of entry and exit really difficult because this is a big barrier when it comes in because people tend to know these firms. And so if you want to break into this industry, you have to uh, really advertise a lot in order to get your name out there. Price war or price fixing is illegal, and this is where you will have, if you have somebody who's trying to break into the industry, you'll have the oligopolies lower their prices really beyond even what the cost is in order to make the good, in order to try to deter these people from the industry or keep them out. It's illegal. The government regulates it um, because that doesn't allow for competition. And so there are the antitrust laws don't allow firms to have this price fixing or price war. Tacit collusion, okay? Tacit means it's like covert, it's secretive, and this is collude is where they come together. And so what happens is that if you have a few um, firms in this industry, what they'll do is they'll work together and they'll coordinate on a price. Now, the way they do it, because it has to, it has to be... Um, secretively because really then what they're doing is acting like a monopoly, which is illegal in the United States. And so there's different ways that they'll kind of send out information about what they might be doing to the price to let somebody know. Otherwise, you'll see that price leadership that will tend to have one change of price and then they all kind of follow with it. For sure, one of the best oligopolies to look at, um, it would be OPEC. 
And what you have with OPEC with that whole collusion is where, I mean, they openly talk about how they will collude. O OPEC, again, deals with the oil industry. And so what happens um, that you usually find is like two or three of them will group together and they will all figure out a price that they will agree upon for the price of gas. And then they will stick with that and until usually somebody slips out and goes a little lower because they want to use that law of demand to their advantage. But tacit collusion is illegal in the United States because then they act like one firm, which is a monopoly, and that doesn't provide for competition. Cartels are what are formed when they collude, and that's what we see. OPEC is a great example of that. An oligopoly is where you have three or more firms that dominate this industry. A duopoly is when you have two. So when we talked about the prisoner's dilemma, which then leads to game theory and um, how firms can figure out their payoff matrix, that's with two firms. And so that's a duopoly. The last thing here is this Herfindahl index or concentration ratio. This is a mathematical formula where you look at the percentage of the market that each firm holds, and then you can see how much of how high that um, Herfindahl index is. So obviously, the highest amount would be ten thousand because what you do for the Herfindahl index is you um, square. The, the market share. So a monopoly, for example, has 100% of the market. So 100 times 100 is 10,000. So that's the highest that the Herfindahl could be. But say you had like four firms and they equally had 25% of the market. Then in order to figure out the Herfindahl index, you would do 25 squared plus 25 squared plus 25 squared plus 25 squared and then you would have um, your answer. If you had one firm that like really dominated and they had 75% of the market, maybe you had a second firm that had 10% of the market, well, that's 75 squared plus 10 squared, so there's 85% of your market. And so that number would be way higher than the 25 squared divided equally, equally among those four firms. So the closer you are to 10,000, the less competition that there is. Um, when you think about perfect competition, you know, do they even own 1% of the market? Because then you could have like 100 firms and at one, one squared 100 times, you can have it as low as 100. So that's what you're looking at with that Herfindahl index. When you have a oligopoly that colludes or has this tacit collusion, we can also say that it's a monopoly because they're acting as one. And so the graph is identical to the monopoly graph that we've been looking at before. So just to review, when we're talking about profit maximizing output, that formula is MR equals MC, and that's where we can find that. When you are looking at the price that this colluding oligopoly would have, you take it up to the demand curve, and that gives you the price. Allocative efficiency is producing that right mix of goods. The formula for that is price equals marginal cost. An oligopoly is never allocatively efficient. Productive efficiency is producing goods as cheaply as possible, that minimum ATC. Uh, an oligopoly is never productively efficient. And again, because of the advertising and the different tactics that they use, use, an oligopoly will never break even. And so they will never achieve that price equals ATC. One of the other things that we talked about was that um, prisoner's dilemma, which then led to game theory and how markets will look at one another. And that's the final thing that I wanted to talk about. So one more time, in order to review, in order to figure out the dominant strategy, you look at what's the best option if um, you didn't have to worry about the other person. And it would obviously be to um, don't market for the um, uh, your competitor, and then for you, it would be to market. That would be your dominant strategies. In order to figure out the Nash equilibrium, you need to look and see, based upon what the other one does, what is your best payoff. So you are the purple here. 
and um, your competitor is the orange. So if your competitor decides to market, then you need to either market or not market, and it would be in your best interest to market. And so that's then when we put the X right here. If your competitor does not market, it would be in your best interest then to market because 400 is a better payoff than zero. If you decide to market, then it would be your competitor's best interest to market also because 100 is better than zero. If you decide not to market, then it would be in your competitor's best interest not to market also. And so when we look here then at the Nash Equilibrium, it would be best for both of you to market if you're trying to determine what your payoff matrix should be. So remember, that's what you need to do when you're trying to figure out the Nash Equilibrium. Okay, so in this one here, they're obviously not colluding because they're trying to determine what each one should do. And so that's then when we get into what that um, looks like. And this is called the kinked demand curve. And the reason that it looks so complicated is because you have these two demand curves. And this here, this blue um, one, is showing the two different demand curves. And then this is where you put the two demand curves together. And so what you need to recognize here is that you have an elastic part of the demand curve and you have an inelastic part of the demand curve. What happens with the elastic part of the demand curve is showing right here, if the firm raises its price, its rivals will not because it wouldn't be in their best interest to go at a higher price because the law of demand says as price goes down, quantity demanded goes up. And so since you're not going in the same direction with price, you're going up and your rivals are not, that's giving a lot of substitutes to consumers. And so that's why you have this more elastic demand curve. Over here what happens is that as you are lowering your price, the rivals are going to have to lower their price also. Well, that's kind of like you're colluding, right? Because you're not really giving different choices to the consumers because everybody's lowering their price. And so what you have here is a more inelastic demand curve. If you recall from what we learned back in the monopoly graph, um, it is not worthwhile for producers to produce in the inelastic portion of the demand curve. So it doesn't make sense for them to do that. Use those the same formulas in order to figure out what a firm should do. In this case here, you just have an awkward looking demand curve and you have a marginal revenue curve that splits because this marginal revenue go curve goes with this part of the demand curve and this marginal revenue curve goes with this part. But you go where MR equals MC. And so um, you have like this downward uh, vertical line for the MR. So MR equals MC, you take it up to the demand curve and that gives you the price that they would charge and where MR equals MC, that gives you the quantity that they would produce at. That is truly the only thing that you need to worry about with this kink demand curve is knowing that this is what it looks like, that you still go where MR equals MC, you take it up to the demand curve and that's going to give you the equilibrium price. And this is the equilibrium quantity. Okay, um, You're not expected to be able to draw this on your own. It's more of just being able to read a graph and figure out price and quantity that go with it. But this graph exists because of the payoff matrix that we saw in the last slide here. This is what this would look like um, if it were graphed out.